applauded. Thank you. Proceed. My views on the proposed agreement can be quickly summarized. First, as you mentioned, the administration has spelled out what it intends to include in the agreement in the November 26th Declaration of Principles. In critical respects, that declaration is ambiguous. In the past, however, the administration has made broad claims of executive power, and it is therefore reasonable to construe this declaration broadly in light of those past claims. Second, broadly construed, the declaration appears to contemplate a legally binding security commitment by the United States to Iraq. The concept of a security commitment was defined by the first President Bush in a report to Congress in 1992. The report said that a security commitment is a, quote, obligation binding under international law of the United States to act in common defense in the event of an armed attack on that country, unquote. Broadly construed, the provisions of the proposed agreement with Iraq fall within this definition. Third, the security commitment that seems to be contemplated by the declaration would go beyond the terms of any security commitment that is now in force for the United States in two respects. First, none of the security commitments now in force commits the United States to defend against internal threats or outlaw groups, as the proposed agreement apparently would. No provision of the Rio Treaty, for example, requires any party to intervene militarily to protect one of the 21 Latin American member governments from a military coup. Second, no security agreement commitment to which the United States is a party commits any party to use military force automatically in the event of an attack on another party. Each makes clear that the use of force is not required if some other response is deemed more appropriate. The proposed agreement broadly construed could require the automatic use of force by the United States. Fourth, the proposed agreement seemingly would also go beyond the scope of typical status of forces agreements. SOFAs, as they're called, traditionally set out rules applicable to the activities of U.S. troops present in host countries and the legal relationships with those countries. SOFAs do not include security commitments, as the proposed agreement with Iraq seemingly would. Fifth, under the Constitution, the President, therefore, cannot conclude the proposed agreement on the basis of his own constitutional authority. Senate or congressional approval would be constitutionally required for two reasons. First, the proposed agreement could reasonably be construed as a promise to place the nation in a state of war. Unless there is an emergency created by a sudden attack or a threat of one, it is evident from the constitutional text, from the intent of the framers, from subsequent custom and practice, and from Supreme Court case law, that the Constitution vests the decision to place the nation in a state of war in the hands of the Congress. Second, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee has said that the Treaty Clause requires that normally significant international commitments be made with the advice and consent of the Senate. It is difficult to imagine an international commitment more significant than the one seemingly contemplated by the Declaration of Principles, which would clearly fall beyond the constitutional authority of the President acting alone. None of the security commitments to which the United States currently is a party was entered into by the President under his own constitutional authority. Fifth, while an unauthorized security commitment of this breadth 
would be unprecedented. Congress has, in fact, had longstanding concerns about the making of such commitments. I might say that in the 1970s, when I was legal counsel to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the issue that we're talking about today was a very, very big deal. During the 60s and 70s, the Senate expressed its belief several times that various base agreements should be submitted as treaties in the belief that the presence of bases in certain countries implied security commitments. The Senate adopted the National Commitments Resolution in 1969, warning that a national commitment cannot be made by the President acting alone. Congress ultimately required that executive agreements be reported to it in the case of the Blocky Act, but it never enacted framework legislation like the War Powers Resolution or the Congressional Budget and Impoundment Control Act that would have restricted the abuse of executive agreements. What the Senate did do was to exercise its advice power under the Constitution concerning what form an agreement should take. In 1978, the Senate adopted S.R.S. 536, which provided that in determining whether a particular agreement should be submitted as a treaty, the President should have the timely advice of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. In practice, the House Committee on Foreign Affairs was also included in these negotiations, in these consultations. In recent years, through consultation under S.R.S. 536 appears to have become, to put it charitably, somewhat uneven. Still, the administration may have a constitutional obligation to seek Senate advice on such an agreement because the Senate is a continuing body and S.R.S. 536 continues to be in force. Consultation with the Congress could help avoid misunderstandings that will inevitably arise either through studied equivocation or inadvertent ambiguity. Finally, in conclusion, you recalled the words of uh, Secretary of Defense Gates before the Senate Armed Services Committee two days ago. It is possible that the administration may now be moving away from a broad construction of the Declaration of Principles of the sort that I have just outlined. But it seems to me that it would be, at this point, premature to jump to any such conclusion. First, I've read the entire transcript of his testimony before the Senate Armed Services Committee. This comment was not included in his prepared statement. It was made in answer to questions by Senators Kennedy and Levin. And if you read the uh, commentary surrounding his response to Senator Levin, I believe it's fair to say that it's not clear to what extent uh, this position was carefully thought through. And as the chairman emphasized in his opening statement, it's important to note the president, after all, did sign the Declaration of Principles, which seems on its face to be inconsistent with the statement made two days ago by the Secretary of Defense, leading to the conclusion that it is all the more important for Congress to get to the bottom of this, to get the facts straight, and to insist upon clarity. I don't want to impute any illicit intention to the administration, but I would simply observe that the administration has an understandable incentive to overstate the scope of the commitment in its communications with the Iraqis and to understate the scope of the commitment in its communication with the Congress. It is essential that the Congress not be led to believe that there is no security commitment if there is one. It is also essential that the Iraqis not be led to believe that there is a security commitment if there is not one. When it comes to the role of the United States in Iraq's future security, Congress and Iraq must be on the same page. If they are not, the consequences could be catastrophic 
both internationally and domestically